Welcome to today's Foresight Dialogue. Uh, we are waiting a few seconds more to allow more people to join. Welcome to those who are joining us. Uh, we still wait uh, a few seconds uh, to allow more people to join. Okay, we can start. Uh, hi, hello everyone. Welcome to this uh, new Foresight Dialogue, the series of events uh, through which uh, the Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change, CMCC, is hosting uh, writers, uh, artists, uh, journalists, uh, scientists, uh, innovators, uh, to discuss the role of communication uh, in accelerating uh, the climate transition. Uh, my name is Alessandra Mazzai. I am part of the communication office uh, at the CMCC Foundation. And I'm very happy today to introduce uh, this webinar with uh, two outstanding speakers, Solitaire Townsend, uh, co-founder and chief solutionist uh, at Futerra, and uh, Ione Anderson, uh, partner of sustainability at Ernst & Young. I will properly introduce uh, uh, the speakers in a while. Let me give me let me give you a brief introduction of the CMCC and the context in which uh, we are organizing this uh, initiative. Uh, CMCC is the Italian Scientific Research Center on Climate Change and its interactions uh, with uh, the environment, uh, the society, uh, the world of business, uh, and of policymakers. Uh, our, our work aims to stimulate sustainable growth, uh, to protect the environment and develop strategies uh, for climate change mitigation and uh, adaptation. Uh, the CMCC is organized in the form of a network distributed throughout Italy uh, with locations uh, in Lecce, Bologna, Caserta, Milano, Sassari, uh, Venezia and Viterbo. Uh, this is a network that involves and collects uh, public and private entities uh, working together on uh, multidisciplinary studies concerning uh, issues of interest to climate sciences. Uh, our scientific activities are uh, distributed in 10 uh, research divisions uh, which share different knowledge uh, and skills uh, uh, related to climate sciences. Uh, we benefit from the extensive research experience uh, of the CMCC uh, members and uh, institutional partners uh, that uh, are listed in this slide. And uh, uh, besides the scientific research, of course, we want to have an impact as uh, uh, shown the, in our mission. Uh, we are committed to inform and facilitate the dialogue between scientists, uh, decision makers, and the general public to support decision and action to benefit uh, uh, the society and the environment. So with this aim, we carry on uh, also educational programs, uh, events, and communication activities for the public at large and many outreach activities uh, and initiatives uh, to involve uh, and to give voice uh, to the climate change research uh, in the in the world uh, the first side dialogue this initiative in which uh, we are uh, hosting this webinar uh, borrows the, um, its name from uh, our digital magazine climate foresight a magazine that looks into the future through interviews uh, to our outstanding speakers, uh, through articles, multimedia, and also a podcast. And this series of webinars is uh, organized in the context of the Climate Change Communication Award, Rebecca Ballestra. 
Um, this is an initiative uh, through which CMCC is building uh, an innovative uh, and growing uh, global platform that collects uh, and rewards uh, the best uh, communication projects worldwide. Uh, and uh, we aim to connect their authors uh, in uh, a network uh, uh, that fosters collaborations, off offers opportunities, and uh, open a space for discussion uh, for climate change communication experts. Uh, the second call for proposals for the award is now closed and the jury is uh, at work to define the winning project among uh, the more than 350 applications uh, received. Um, if you go to this website, uh, www.cmccaward.eu, you can find uh, already online uh, a map uh, showing all the, com the compelling projects uh, that apply the, to this, this year's edition of the award. Um, the results of this year's edition will be announced in a public event in November, uh, on November 16. Um, if you stay tuned, uh, you will receive soon from us uh, uh, more information about this final event uh, that will be held in Florence, Italy. A few technical information for this webinar. Uh, the latest part uh, will be dedicated to a Q&A session. Uh, so you can write directly your questions uh, in the Q&A panel of your Zoom uh, screen, uh, even is, is, during the presentation uh, as they come, and uh, I will pose them to the speakers uh, at the end uh, of uh, their dialogue. Um, the webinar is recorded and will be published uh, on our YouTube channel. You will find it there. Uh, now it's finally time to, to properly introduce you today's speakers. Welcome Soliter, Soliter Townsend. I was on mute. Hello, thank you so much for having me here. And welcome Yoni Anderson. Hi everyone. Thank you for having me and for organizing this. Thank you for joining. Um, Soliter is a renowned sustainable, sustainability expert. She is co-founder and chief solutionist at Futerra, uh, a change agency, um, but it is also a, pro a product incubator, a training academy. Um, Soliter uh, was named in 2023 Agency Lead of the Year at the Edu Eight Weeks Sustainability Award and was named uh, one of the Vogue Business 100 Innovators in the category Sustainability Thought Leaders. Um, well, I, I, invite, I really invite you to know more about Solitaire after this webinar, to watch her popular TED talk, to read uh, her column on Forbes and uh, also her most recent book, The Solutionist, uh, which is just uh, on her library <laughs> right there i see product placement product placement <laughs> <That> basic <laughs> marketing <laughs> uh, and uh, sorry that today we'll dialogue with uh, another solutionist and sustainability expert yone anderson uh, she is an associate partner for sustainability at uh, ernst and young uh, she crafts uh, sustainability strategies uh, uh, that blend science with business innovation for companies. Um, she draws uh, from two decades of distinguished international diplomatic service across global and regional multilateral organization. Um, now uh, her career in sustainability, climate change, and biodiversity uh, blends communication and science. Um, and uh, she supported also influential science policy bodies like the IPCC. Um, Yone is also passionate about uh, promoting sustainability uh, practices worldwide, also producing uh, documentary films. Uh, she, she realized uh, uh, the film uh, Amazon 4.0 and uh, other, um, other films uh, uh, focused on the exploitation of the Amazon forest. Um, we are very happy to have you today here to uh, to help uh, us uh, building this uh, last piece that is missing in our series of uh, foresight dialogue, um, which is uh, the site on the private sector, how the private sector can 
have a role in this change uh, and uh, on the other side uh, how this uh, big change that climate change is posing to us uh, is affecting and inf influencing the private sector. I leave the floor to you and we will see you later for the Q&A session with the public. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you and uh, I'm thrilled, Solitaire and Alessandra, I'm thrilled to be here with you and this great uh, foresight space created by CMCC, um, a research center dedicated to climate research. Um, as Alessandra mentioned, I have uh, a long history working with science, uh, mostly at the Nexus uh, Science and Policy, and now Science and Business. And um, Solitaire, I, I read your book, The Solutionist, the one, and the back in your uh, <laughs> library, yes. Um, the, solu the solution is how business can fix the future. And I love it. I highly recommend the reading. When you published your book, I bought and read it in a day, looking for answers. And what I found was that um, we have a lot in common, just as I believe that we have with our audience today. Um, I identified myself as an architect solutionist, just like you. And I will ask you to tell us a bit more about that shortly. Uh, before we go into that, I thought I would uh, just say a few words about why uh, we are here today together. And, um, and that's because the business environment has changed. We see that, I see that closely. And we see that change is inevitable. It's inevitable from the eyes of all the research, the IPCC research, all the, the science is telling us. And um, CEOs of companies know that they have to transform to remain competitive. Um, at EY, for example, we work with companies to identify value and uh, long-term value that can be created for customers, uh, consumers, and for society, and, and how to communicate that to the market. Um, a couple of years ago, just to cite uh, a research that we um, we have um, as, uh, from a partnership with the Oxford Said Business School. Um, they studied the complex factors that um, behind the high failure rate of transformations. And, and they did that to explore how leaders can drive transformations that result in lasting change. Um, I mentioned that because that research identified that to maximize the level of success, organizations need to excel at implementing leading practices around six drivers. And one of those was inspire, creating a vision for all to believe in. Um, I really believe in inspiration and inspiration as a way to engage and to get people to act and um, come up with solutions, whatever they are. And um, so with that, I would like to ask you, Solitaire, um, Solutionists, can you tell us a bit more about the principle and who solutionists are besides the ones here today? <laughs> thank you so much, Ione. And um, first of all, I want to thank the CMCC for the incredible work that they do. I use CMCC resources, particularly all the fantastic examples of communications that have been submitted um, over the past. So thank you so, so, so much for that work. Not only you actually answered that question in the question, because actually solutionists are the people who are on this call. The very fact that you've turned up to watch either sort of right now or later on YouTube, that you've turned up to watch us talking about what it's going to take to actually solve some of the challenges that we face today, that makes you a very special and slightly unusual person. So all of you who are listening, you're very special and slightly unusual. Now, I was looking for a word to sum up these incredible people that I've come across in two decades of working in sustainability. The entrepreneurs, the CEOs, the activists, the creatives, the change makers, because we had words like change maker, but change could be bad. We had words like activists. We had words like sustainability professional. We had all these terms and none of them seemed to sum up the people, the actual human beings who are doing this work. And so I stumbled across the word solutionist in the English dictionary, in the Oxford English dictionary. It's a genuine word and it means a solver of problems. Now, all we have to do is look out of our windows 
to see the problems that we're facing today. The problems in society with social exclusion, with uh, youth fatalism, with anxiety, with um, inequality, and of course, the extreme challenges and problems that we're facing in our natural environment. Uh, problems that were not anticipated by those who laid down the rules of the economies that we exist in. They simply didn't realize that there would be natural limits um, to how economies would function. So solutionists are those who are solving the problems that were laid down um, in, in, previous, in previous decades. Now, it's not as if there was people back then who were going, ha, 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 how are we going to ruin the climate? Although to be honest, there might be a few who today feel a bit like that. But these weren't in an intentional problems. So many of the problems we face today are caused by people trying to solve problems from the past. So as solutionists, we want to learn about what has worked. We also want to learn about what hasn't worked and see if we can bring our part of the answer. And the good news is that there are hundreds of thousands of millions of us. There are so many people out there around the world who are trying to be part of the solution, either on a single specific issue which they're trying to solve, on massive global issues which they're trying to take on, on huge opportunities they're trying to bring. And actually, it's a wonderful, wonderful group of people, and I'm so excited to be part of it. Excellent. Yeah, you know that um, one of the one of the, my favorite quotes from the book um because of of my work with science and scientists um says um you said science tells us what to do while storytelling makes us want to do it um how do we tell this story better that's one of the reasons my solution to that question was to make a documentary film i had my friends and many of those are scientists and i thought well it's about time everybody's talking about the Amazon and there's all this happening and people don't know what it's like. And um, that was during COVID in 2020. So um, with we already have all the images that we could possibly want about the Amazon. So um, my friend and I decided that this was, you know, something that we wanted to do. And that was one of those possible solutions. But Perhaps you can tell us, how do we tell the story better? We're talking here in this uh, CMCC space. How do we tell the science better than we have been? So um, just a few weeks ago at Climate Week, I was with a very, very famous scientist and he um he has set many of the. I, I won't name him because I'm going to. I'm going to uh, 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 tell, tell a tell a cheeky story about him. Um, but he has set many of the uh, the greatest frameworks around science in terms of um, the planetary um, issues that we're facing. And I told him that the science shows that human beings will believe a story over a fact. And he said, "No, I don't believe that's true." I was like, "You're denying." the storytelling power in the same way that people deny climate change. Just because as scientists, many, many scientists don't want that to be true. They want human beings to be empirical. They want us to be rational. They want themselves to be rational. And actually saying a science, a, a story can blow all of that away can be really threatening. But it's true. We are human beings and we have our system one and we have our system two, um, uh, as Kevin has put forward to us. We have our thinking fast and our thinking slow. Slow. And actually, we save up our rational thinking, we save up our deep, clearly thinking, rational thinking for very, very important decisions that come along ever so often. Most of the time, we're just running on habit. And actually, those habits tend to be stories. We all know that we teach our children stories before we teach them any facts at all. We tell them fairy stories before we start trying to teach them to even read and write. Human beings are built of stories. In fact, over 60 percent of the conversations we have in a day will just be us telling anecdotes to each other about what's happened in about what's happened in our day. And so that shows us the incredible power of storytelling, because it carries something that human beings want more than anything, which is emotion. 
It carries that dopamine, that serotonin, those neurotransmitters that get us excited. We all know that. We go to the cinema in order to feel something, excitement, hope, love, fear, all of these emotions, which are so, so, so powerful. Now, most of the people who are watching this will already know this mystical, mythical, but very, very true power of storytelling. So what are the stories we have to tell about climate change? Now, I'm going to tell you my opinion about it and others may disagree and I hope we get some questions about it but I think that climate change is now communicating itself it has taken over the job with the incredible heat waves with the terrible floods with the wildfires with the extreme weather events that we're having around the world climate change is now communicating itself and when we ask people worldwide when we survey them about whether they're concerned about climate change overwhelmingly they are but we did some survey work with Ipsos Mori um, uh, two years ago, asking people whether they heard more about the problems or the solutions to climate change. And overwhelmingly, nearly 70 percent of people said they hear only about the problems, not about the solutions. So if climate change is now communicating itself, we have to tell the stories of the solutions. Now, how do you tell the stories of the solutions? In my book, it would have been a much shorter book if I'd have just listed the technologies I could have just listed, in fact, there is a chapter that lists out quite a lot of the technologies that we need. But instead of listing the, te the technologies, I decided to tell the stories of the people because stories are always about people. You cannot tell a story about a technology. You can't tell a story about science. You have to put human emotions in there. Now, you can tell a story about an animal if you give it human emotions. You can even anthropomorphize which is the word a piece of technology if you give it a name put some googly eyes on it and pretend it has emotions but you can only tell stories about people's emotional journeys and that's what in the book what I do and I tell stories about some of the founders of incredible organizations like Impossible Foods and Oatly and Who Gives a Crap and I talk about the stories of some incredible people like Bill Gates and the CEOs of Ikea and Orsted etc because it's their stories as people it was them that I found fascinating, even though the technology and the science they represent is very, very important. So tell the stories of the solutions and make sure those stories about people. And that's where it gets hard. If you're not a storyteller by trade, if that's not your profession, you've probably been taught to never talk about people except in the third person and to never, ever talk about yourself. You never talk about yourself in an academic paper or in a research paper. It's almost as if you don't exist except as the name at the top. It's always in this very, very objective tone of voice, which is why people don't get terribly emotional about academic research. What people get emotional about is the story. So people on this call, people out there, either tell your own story of your own experience of climate change or tell the story of the people that you've met, of the people who have been affected, of the people who are trying to make change. I've decided to tell a story of these incredible solutionists of people who I tell a story of um, Hasebi-san in Japan who uh, was a normal businessman, a normal Japanese businessman doing quite well, getting quite senior. And then he had meningitis and he almost died. And in that experience of being going from being quite a strong business person to being completely weak, having to be only surviving because he was being fed and cared for by his family and by medical uh, people, being completely at the mercy of whether people are kind and good and will look after him. That's when he had this realization that there must be more to his life than just making money for his company. Now, he ended up as CEO of one of the biggest companies in the world, but he's kept on to that revelation that he had when almost dying as part of his journey and I find that story of his emotional realization that there was more to life than just being a company man that story is so much more compelling than some of the fantastic science and products that Cal his company has produced yeah I, I remember reading that and uh, that's uh... And that was a great example. Um, you mentioned uh, technology, and of course, now that uh, we're seeing the transformations that need to happen with all the industries, uh, oil and gas, renewable energy is at the top of that list. Everybody's talking about it, um, perhaps talking about it too much, not looking at all the other possibilities, but um, adapting, and this is a quote from your book also, adapting to necessary change isn't just possible, it's what drives innovation. Um, 
What are a couple of uh, favorite examples of innovations that have inspired you? Oh, there are so many to pick from. Um, uh, I like small innovations, like the folks at Small, S-M-O-L, who are basically making very small, very effective little pods that you can use to do your washing, and they post them to you. So although it's very simple, it's very convenient. For me as a consumer, it's just a better way to consume. I love that innovation where they had to work out how to get this through a post box. How, how small did it have to be to get through a post box? And what did that mean for the entirety of the product they had to make? I love those small little innovations. Or even an innovation that I've been involved in myself. So I love cats. I'm a real pet person and cats are my pet. And unfortunately, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change tells us that pets are quite unsustainable because they eat a lot of meat. Now, a lot of that meat might be off cuts from the meat industry, but the meat industry is not very sustainable. So actually those off cuts themselves aren't sustainable so rather than go oh i'm either going to ignore that and just keep having a cat and just pretending it's okay or i'm going to deny it and say actually no it's not true instead i decided to do something about it and i did some research and i discovered insect-based cat food so um i actually started a cat food company love bug to help uh, to help solve that and one of the reasons why i really enjoyed being part of that innovation is that it got me something that i wanted so just too often in sustainability, we think it's denial or sacrifice. Either pretend there's not a problem or sacrifice everything you care about. Those are not two options I'm prepared to live with. That's where innovation comes through to smash through that binary and said, no, if this is a problem, we accept it. But we also want the benefits and the joys and the happiness and the quality of life that comes with the modern world. So how do we get this without avoiding that? And um, innovators are the ones who work out ways that we can. And in, in the book from um, new types of energy technology, how we travel, new types of food, new types of clothing, there are so many people who are going, no, we deserve to have the, the good life that we want to have, but without the negative impact. And we're not going to compromise between those two things. And in some ways, the tighter that gets, the more challenging it gets, the more innovative the answers are that you come up with. Great. Um, the risk, of course, when you do something or when you don't do something is that um, it might be perceived as greenwashing, which leads me to another favorite quote uh, from your book. And that is more often than not, greenwashing is the product of good intentions, an enthusiastic desire to share what you've done well. That doesn't excuse it, but it helps you to know what to look out for in your own communications. So um, perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about greenwashing. I mean, I, I, I really like that because that can be uh, an excuse also, you know, because you're really trying to do something and you're, what's that fine line between uh, saying what you're doing and trying to sell something that you're not? Yeah. So um, when I look at the whole world of greenwashing, I've done a lot of analysis for this. And uh, I know that the EU has said that over 50 percent of the ads that they see are technically greenwashed. The UK here in the UK, the Competition and Markets Authority judged over 40 percent of ads were greenwashed. Many of the companies that I work with, when I show them their greenwash, it's not malicious. It's mistaken. It's not someone going, how can we lie to our consumers? Now, that does exist. It really, truly does. So there is malicious, deliberate, carefully designed greenwash. But it's a very small amount of greenwash that happens. Most of greenwash is like, this is so cool. It makes me so much better, feel better about my job. This is something which I want to tell the world because I'm so proud that we did it. Let's get it out there. It's over enthusiasm without a great deal of knowledge. Now, um, even just a week ago, week and a half ago, I did some training inside a company um, for their marketing teams around greenwash. We spent sort of two hours together with their marketing teams showing them greenwash and helping them learn to spot it and at the beginning they couldn't spot any of the greenwash because we deliberately picked things which weren't obviously so um, they weren't giving enough context or perhaps they were using words like natural not carefully enough they were just positive enthusiastic often truthful but not the whole truth so there's a couple of ways out of this one is 
bring in some experts actually double check what you're planning to do no advert or claim goes out into the public without being checked by a lot of people so add a greenwash check to that check um because particularly in the eu there are some very very serious repercussions coming the eu commission has put forward four percent of operating profit as a as a tax on anyone who greenwashes but secondly, try to swap your brain around in terms of how you think about green claims. Even the word claim, what can we claim? How can we claim to be better? What can we claim to have done? Even that puts you into a mindset that's starting from a greenwash perspective. You're starting from growing. How much credit can we get for what we've done? And the public aren't interested. The consumers are never going to go for what you've done on sustainability. What they want is help because your consumers themselves want to be the hero. Those that the, your consumers are the one, she wants to be the one who's done the good thing, who's the great mum to her children, who's the great person in society. So rather than trying to make claims, offer help. Try to show what you're doing on sustainability helps your consumer be more sustainable, how she can have a better impact. And just by taking that claims head down and putting a helpful head on, then you actually avoid a lot of the the mindset that leads to greenwash because we do have an extra problem which it's something can technically not be greenwash but the consumer can still smell it like it is so just by offering help now a lot of the companies that um that i interviewed they are very good at making their consumer feel like the hero when you take um uh something like oomph Oomph is a fantastic product. It's a, a vegan um, a meat replacement, but it's designed for sports spas. So it's all sort of got, uh, it's all got this fantastic black packaging and it's all sort of very um, sports bar-y and it's all sort of barbecue flavour and um, a hot sauce flavour. And uh, what Oomph talks about, it, rather than talking about its lower environmental footprint, it talks about you, the consumer, being a hero. How can you be the hero by eating this product? And just by doing that, the flavor of it, quite straight to talk about the flavor of the food, but that it doesn't feel as much like greenwash because they're making about the consumer rather than about themselves. So even if you've got good intentions, even if you have no intention of lying, even if you are, are so against greenwash, you can still greenwash. So good intentions and no protection against making a mistake. So get the experts in. Don't believe your good intentions are going to protect you. And secondly, stop trying to claim to be wonderful. Stop trying to make it all about you and make it all about your consumer and you're less likely to do it anyway. Yes, absolutely. And uh, when we talk about consumers, uh, of course, we there's so much emphasis about um, scope one and two. So scope one being the direct emissions and uh, two emissions derived from the energy that companies uh, purchase. Um, but we have um, scope three, everybody else, um, and where consumers come in. And that's where you also have a say and in, in the power to make uh, good choices and to feel like you are uh, part, not only part of the conversation, but helping to lead that conversation. Um, and, and um, sustainability conversation. Um, in your book, uh, Solitaire, um, you propose action and as a way of uh, out of eco anxiety, as you call it. And, um, and it reads that um, eco anxiety now affects 68% of adults in the US and 75% of young people globally. Um, and you say, if you want to boost your well-being, solve a problem and make one that matters. I don't know how many people we have here with us, Alessandra, but, and I don't think we have one of those poll things that people can vote, but I wonder if our audience feels this eco-anxiety and if perhaps we can use that to sort of close this part and uh, open for questions so that we can have enough time to have a conversation with all the people that joined us here today i would be very surprised if people didn't feel eco anxiety you you would have to be pretty cut off from the world to not feel it at the moment i feel it my family feels it my 13 year old niece feels it but one of the things which i talk about in the book 
is that worry doesn't change anything. Anxiety makes no difference. Actually doing something about the things that you worry about are the very best way to overcome it. There's no level of self-care or or being good to yourself or trying to do mantras or trying to uh, meditate that is going to get you over eco-anxiety any better than actually taking action. Now, you mentioned um, in a, a moment ago about the fact that you're an uh, architect. So my book, I go into three types of change makers, architects, who are big world thinkers who like thinking about all the big strategies, how everything goes together, pulling together this big, big, big plan for how change can happen. But they can sometimes struggle to activate them. I'm a, I'm an architect. I'm, I'm a love, love, love up there. But then I get really lost when it comes down to what to do. On the other end, you've got um, actioners. Actioners do. They are the ones who go, this is great. Thank you so much for talking about all of this. But what do I do? What are the things which I actually need to get on with? Show me the plan and I will go and do it. Now, actioners are desperately important for sustainability because otherwise nobody would ever do anything. But sometimes they think that doing something wrong is better than not doing anything at all, which means sometimes they can get caught into continuing to take action that isn't working anymore, which is why you're architects work really well with your actioners the architects always have got a plan for what the best thing to do is and the actioners are great at doing it so those two groups need to come together but there's a third group and it took me some time of interviewing and in fact there were some people who I interviewed some from some amazing companies who kind of pinged this in my head and in fact the CEO of um of Ikea was one of them which is what I call accelerators and accelerators are people people They know what makes human beings tick. They're great at putting teams together, great at keeping people motivated, inspired. They know who needs to do what, not just what needs doing. And they give real permission to people to talk about this for the fact that it's something that in their organizational culture, you can take action on. And within this group, we will have, within those who are listening now and later on, there'll be architects, there'll be actioners and there'll be accelerators. Job number one, find out which one you are. And job number two, surround yourself with people who've got different skills to you because you're going to need to build a team and they're going to need to be motivated and they're going to need to be cared for. And you're also going to need to take action and you're going to need to do something and actually make things happen. And you're going to need a plan. And that's why you need all three together. So I'd love to know in the chat which one people think they are. How many uh, architects do we have? How many actioners do we have? And how many accelerators do we have? Um, and perhaps people can even contact with each other. If there's anybody out there who needs to connect with people who are different to them, uh, maybe say so in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, um, Solitaire. Thank you, Yone, for your uh, very interesting dialogue. Uh, we really invite uh, people uh, who is joining the webinar to to, jo- to join also this uh, this session, which is open to anyone. Um, we are receiving uh, uh, some questions. Uh, um, I I will try, note chat is disabled, they say. Uh, in the Q&A session, you, in, this, in the Q&A panel, you should write, not in the note, not in the chat, but in the Q&A. Okay, oh, well, uh, I also ask uh, my colleague Roberta if she can also uh, enable the chat, which can be useful in order to allow exchange among the, the um, participants as suggested by Solitaire. In the meantime, if you have questions uh, for the panelists, uh, please uh, um, write in the Q&A uh, panel. Um, we. I've received a question from a colleague at CMCC, Marina Menga, who asks uh, um, on the other way around, uh, what can uh, us as consumer, how can we push uh, companies to do better? It's a brilliant question, actually. And it's one which sometimes people feel like they ha- don't have any power and that all the power sits with cus- with companies. I can tell you, working with many of the biggest companies in the world, They are obsessed with you. They are obsessed with what you, the customer, think and what you do. And in the book, I go into the example of plant-based eating. So I work a lot with a lot of the uh, big food companies. And I can tell you, none of them saw plant-based coming. 
they weren't ready, they didn't have products, they didn't realize it was coming. Veganism had always been a thing. Vegetarianism was coming up a little bit. But actually, there was a, a TV program called Game Changers. And Game Changers was a lot of sports people, athletes, bodybuildings, even cage fighters talking about how eating more plant based gave them availability of protein, availability of calories much easier than meat did. And it massively increased over time a huge desire for more plant based foods. That was a completely consumer led movement. Now you've got a lot of companies that are catching up. You've got a lot of businesses who are now providing great um, resources. Even just down your supermarket, you can find plant based options. But it was actually started from consumers. So one, what you buy, every time you buy, you vote. Every single thing you vote is you're voting for the world that you want with what you buy. Secondly, you can do what Professor Catherine Hayhoe, who is one of the most outstanding climate scientists I know, Catherine Hayhoe says the most important thing to do about climate change is to talk about it. So post on social media about what you're buying and about what you're not buying and why. And tag those companies. There's an amazing um, uh, campaign in fashion called Who Made My Clothes? It started after there was a terrible disaster called Rana Plaza, where a huge number of women lost their lives because they were working in sweatshops and a fire happened. It really struck a lot of people in fashion, people who love fashion, people who are obsessed with fashion, not people outside of fashion. And those people inside fashion started taking photographs of the tags inside their clothes and just tagging the company who made their beloved jacket, their most favorite coat, their amazing pair of shoes and saying, who made my clothes? And that has really pushed a huge movement around transparency inside the fashion industry that didn't exist beforehand. So one, every time that you buy something, you're voting for the world you want. And two, raise your voice, say what you want, talk about what you're buying and what you're not buying and tag those companies when you're doing it on social media because I promise you they listen. They're obsessed with you. Thank you. It's all it. Um, going back to echo anxiety, uh, Thomas uh, is asking uh, uh, what kind of stories uh, and narratives can we use to prevent people from getting overwhelmed with all the problems of the world and become uh, apathetic? I promise this is a great question. And I will promise you, I am more afraid of climate fatalism than I am of climate change. Climate change is just chemistry. It's planetary chemistry. It's difficult. It's challenging. But we actually have a lot of the solutions that we want. Human beings are complicated. We know more about climate change scientifically than we do human consciousness we don't even know what human consciousness is but we understand the science of our of our climate so um overwhelm with the problems doom scrolling through everything that's wrong with the world can lead to a fatalism a giving up an apathy and ennui a terror and it can have really really negative effects so the narratives that we should tell are of the solutions. It's a very, very, very simple answer. Tell the stories of the people who are taking action and how they're benefiting of it. Tell the stories of the technologies. Tell the stories of the changes which are already happening in the world. Find the amazing characters. Um, I often uh, talk about the fact that there's a reason why Erin Brockovich is one of the most famous environmentalists. There's a movie about her. There's a story about her as a solutionist. So um, uh, what I tend to find is we don't need to tell the story of the problem anymore. We need to tell the story of the solutions. And if you've got a solution yourself or if you know solutions. And if, I, um, if I'm with particularly a young person who feels overwhelmed, what I tell them is how amazing it feels working in this movement, how incredible it feels to be part of the solution, how one third of jobs on LinkedIn now ask for sustainability skills, executive jobs this is. And so actually how, rather than worrying about it, get a job in saving the world. Um, Gwyn, sorry for, not pro for my pronunciation, Foster, another participant asks, uh, uh, what do you feel about how to bridge the generational uh, changes? Uh, elders versus youth, uh, yeah. different values and different uh, disciplines. There's always been 
significant generational differences. Um, I'm Gen X, the generation who always gets forgotten. Everyone always talks about the boomers, the millennials and the, Je- and the Zs. And it's like, hi, Gen X here. <laughs> so born in the 70s. We always get, we always get um, uh, dropped out. But I remember my parents talking about the problem with their parents and their grandparents. There's always generational differences. At the moment, we have a quite unique generational difference. One, number one, because there's more generations alive together than there has been throughout history because of longevity. So we have people who are living much longer, which means you have got a lot of people of different generations. Usually, it's usually throughout all of history, there's been more young people than there's been older people. And of course, here in Europe and places like Japan, that's no longer the case. So number one, we have a lot of people from different generations. And secondly, right now, we have a very, very big difference between older generations and younger generations. And it's not on values. And it's not on uh, on on how people feel. The big difference is on media consumption. So people under 30 consume social media and people over 30 and over 40 consume traditional media. And there's very little crossover. So perhaps you read some newspapers and read some television and spend a bit of time on Instagram. But most of your news and information you get through traditional media or you spend your entire time on YouTube, on TikTok, and you actually don't consume any traditional media, which means the different generations are getting different information, completely different information. In fact, the vast majority of people under 30 don't consume any news at all worldwide. Well over 50% don't consume any news at all worldwide unless it comes through TikTok. So that's the big difference that we have. It's not a difference of values. Human beings have always been human beings. It's not a difference of perspective necessarily. It's a difference of information and people are getting information in very, very different ways. And so how do we overcome that? Well, um, one of the ways is to uh, go to where the young people are, maybe spend a little bit more time on TikTok and elsewhere. And there's a lot of people who are working to try to make sure that that information gap is, is closed and that people who are older and are consuming newspapers like I still read a newspaper that automatically makes me old (laughs) still reading newspapers and part of the old generation try to spend more time there but it is going to be an issue um it's less of an issue for those who are under 40 because they are consuming social media and their children are consuming consuming social media so they're in the same uh bubble if that makes sense and of course as more generations come along they'll spend more time online But um, uh, as always, empathy, compassion, listening, learning, storytelling. But the big challenge is uh, is media consumption. And a lot of the decision makers in the world, leaders, business leaders, government leaders, uh, CEOs, presidents exist in one of those bubbles and they don't see anything that's happening in the other one. And I think that's going to lead to a very interesting decade. Connected to this question, there is the one of Federico Cavallucci, who says uh, that we mentioned the genera- generational differences, uh, youth elderly, but what about cross-country differences? Uh, for example, high-income countries uh, versus developing countries. How do yeah. we ensure that the stories pushing for solutions to climate change uh, overcome cultural and socioeconomic barriers? It's a great question. Um, most of the most amazing, compelling, passionate stories that I tend to find are actually from the global south. Um, I'm not sure, I could, the name of the movie escapes me. It was an incredible movie about a young man who hand built a, a, a wind turbine in his village because he wanted to turn the lights on. These in, in my book, I've got a whole chapter around some of the stories from the global south which are extraordinary of people who are using um their energy their rage their passion their optimism another thing which we find is that there's a great deal less climate doom in the global south even though the global south is being hit very hard by climate change because there's this sense that the solutions are good for those countries that the only way you're going to get the lights to turn on in parts of sub-Saharan Africa, in parts of the Andes, et cetera, is through solar panels. It's the only way, it's the only way the lights are ever going to turn on. No one's ever going to build a coal power station for some of these villages. And so there's a great deal of enthusiasm. So I think we there are very, very, very serious um, barriers culturally. There are barriers um, uh, language-wise. You know, we're holding this session in English. Um, translations are possible. 
But one of the things which new technologies can give us is the opportunity to hear stories from around the world. So um, there are more and more stories being told. There's more and more stories being told of traditional cultures, of indigenous cultures. There are more stories being told. Um, at Netflix has a whole series of stories from around the world where um, various celebrities go and visit solutions that are in different parts of the world. So I would I would say the the stories are compelling wherever they come from the world. So people are interested in people. And if you've got a good enough story, if it's a passionate enough story, it doesn't matter on whether it comes from Dublin or Dakar or Delhi, if it's a passionate story. And I think we're beginning to see storytellers around the world being able to be much, much, much better at telling those stories from the global south. Um, and you know that's where a lot of the mindsets are that the whole world needs. Thank you, Solitaire. Um, I would have a question for Yone. So I I give a pause to Solitaire who can rest her voice for two minutes. <laughs> I, I I have a question for Yone because um, given your role in um, in supporting the firms and companies to build their sustainability strategies, uh, what are the in your opinion the the most common uh, misconceptions and barriers? Uh, that prevent them and prevent people in general from engaging with sustainability initiatives uh, and what is the way out are there strategies that uh, uh, can address these uh, obstacles um thank you alessandra first of all i just want to say i'm so excited that i see the you know, growing number of questions here on the chat and that usually doesn't happen we're going to be out of time with so many wonderful questions so i'll be quick um the biggest misconception is that sustainability is costly. So uh, companies shy away from trying to do the right thing because they think it's gonna cost too much. The, the chief financial officer, a lot of times will look at the number and say, no, you know, we can't do that, it's too risky. But more risky than that is the risk uh, of the planet not doing it, the risk of not doing it and taking in the global picture, you know, taking in all the natural resources that you need Basically, everything that we consume come from natural resources. And all that science is telling us is that those are not infinite. And, and we have climate change and we have so many issues that we need to consider. So uh, in short, I would say that providing evidence of the economic benefits of sustainability, such as reduced operational costs and increased market demand for sustainable products, which goes back to all our wonderful um, people here in the audience who would probably be more likely to buy a sustainable product than something that is not sustainable. So companies are slowly um, understanding that that it, they need to consider that factor and, and that sustainability is not automatically just one more cost that they can't afford to have right now. Thank you, Yone. Um, there is a quite long uh, comment by uh, Daniel on uh, on the QA. I don't know if you solitaire had the chance to to read it. Um, uh, it's uh, connected to the greenwashing uh, uh, topic we addressed before. Uh, he says uh, bringing in experts uh, to me as a solution to greenwashing seems a bit uh, naive. Many experts uh, go to the conventional way, selling uh, cheap solutions. When looking uh, at the incidence of the carbonization claims uh, being technically fully okay, uh, for example, following general accounting standards, uh, they may not deliver an impact. I don't think um, you need to read out that whole question. It's quite a long question. I think I get what, what Daniel's speaking about. And later you. on, Daniel's put a um, put another comment around offsets. Now, um, uh, years and years and years ago, 20 years ago, when I first started more, more than 20 years ago when I first started working in this movement. Um, I thought offsets were a great idea. Um, it seemed to be like a brilliant way to get the polluter to pay, to actually get companies to send um, a great deal of capital and resources towards nature. My views on that have changed. Hey, well, welcome to being able to change your mind um, as, as time goes over. But not everybody's has. And I think it is a beginning of a movement. A couple of things about this. One is... We have to find a way to make sure that we don't cut off a huge amount of capital and money going to nature. 
um, and offers it to a very simple way with many, many problems associated with it for that to do. So how do we make sure that that capital to nature continues? And in fact, um, perhaps even more goes. And I've written articles about this in terms of the potential of nature positive to do so. The issues around um, around experts is it's always difficult to pick your experts and it's always challenging when what the rules are are not quite as strong as what you as an individual might think that they should be. I think job number one is to make sure that people are staying with the rules, which they're not 40% of people, 40% of claims are already outside of greenwash. But if you don't think that the definition of greenwash is strong enough, particularly when it comes to um, off to offsetting, then raise your voice around it. And in fact, the EU very well might agree with you because there's new rules that are coming down from the EU around uh, particularly uh, no longer being able to claim carbon neutral. So I think some of those challenge, some of those problems are, um, are are partly on the way to being solved. But the other thing is is that folks have to be given space to change their mind on this, and a lot of CEOs and leaders have been sold in on there being a solution, which we're now saying might not be the solution. So we've got to keep up the pressure, keep telling a different story, but being prepared for the fact it might take some people some time to change their mind. Thank you, Solita. Um... Arianna, uh, a colleague of us at CMCC, uh, asks, uh, what's the role of the media in the relationship between consumers and companies? Uh, is it just a direct and bilateral relationship or are there any intermediaries uh, which can play an active role? Oh, yes, very much. So when we talk about the media, obviously, a lot of people over 40 immediately think the news media or the TV media and everybody under 40 thinks you've been YouTube. So first of all, to remind ourselves that the media is now a huge, enormous set of very, very, very different platforms um, and channels. There are very, very significant intermediaries. I am part of one of those industries, which is the advertising and PR industry. So the advertising and PR industry are incredibly powerful intermediaries. In fact, a great deal of those greenwash adverts and those greenwash claims have been pushed through an ad, an advertising agency or a PR agency. So there's a great deal of work now underway to work on that industry. It's a two trillion dollar business industry. This is not a small industry. And it's the industry that enables every other industry to do what it does without the advertising, PR and professional services industries. The rest of business doesn't function. Um, but it's relatively invisible industry to the public. You know, very few ad agencies have got a sort of public profile. So it's where a lot of focus is at the moment. So they're the race to zero. The race to zero is the UN campaign to try to get businesses to join up to the Paris Agreement. The race to zero is revising its rules for professional services and advertising agencies. And I'm part of changing those rules in order to help those companies be much clearer about the role that they play because they have a relatively small footprint. They do have a footprint, they, you know, they have some buildings, they have some flights, but compared to their clients, their footprints are tiny. But they have huge brain prints, really, really, really big influence on the world around them. And so there's more push for them to be transparent about who their clients are and about who they're working for and the type of work that they're doing. There's more push for them to be um, open about how they've influenced the public influence public behaviours, influence public opinions. There's things around um, uh, service admissions and actually trying to work out how is the advice that agencies and professional services give them. So yes, there is a very, very big industry between the consumer and the company. And it's an industry that deserves a lot more attention. Thank you, Solita. I, I would pose the last question because time is running out. Uh, we have a few more questions. I will I will share them anyway with our uh, speakers uh, in case they they want to uh, to, to follow up. Um, the question is from Agnese uh, from CMCC, um, and it is about science. Um, what uh, role uh, does trust play in communication in the private sector compared to the science sector? So I'll have a word and then I'll hand over to any final word. So when uh, trust surveys are done, uh, businesses come very high on trust for, cons 
from consumers. Now, the people on this call might not be the kind of people who do feel that, but the vast majority of the public actually trust businesses very, very much, um, are almost equal to, and in some countries higher, then they trust scientists. Um, uh, that means there's a really important role for businesses in being trustworthy in how they talk about the science, which is why avoiding greenwash becomes so important. We need everybody to be talking about the solutions. We need the creatives in Hollywood, in Bollywood and in Nollywood. We need the creatives on TikTok and YouTube to be doing that. I'm doing a lot of work of that myself at the moment. We need storytellers in, in, in schools and in universities. We need governments talking about this. We need activists out there shouting it. And we need businesses who have these huge, huge, huge budgets to tell stories to the public. We need everybody to be talking about the solutions. And we need everybody to be, to be holding each other to the account. Um, now, one of the most important things that we know from the scientists is that the scientists tell us there is still a window. They've told us exactly how bad things are, exactly how bad things could get, but they've also told us it is not over yet. And in fact, Johan Rockström stood beside me and he said that it was almost as morally problematic to say there's no hope as there is to deny climate change, because they both have the same impact of people not doing anything. So we need everybody communicating this, including all of you to your friends and family. So everybody's got a role to play. Only. Great. Yes, I completely agree. Can have said it better, and um, and um, I think we we have CMCC here, and um, when we talk about science and research, they can tell us um, even better than anybody. And the audience, I think, um, people who perhaps mostly scientists who have been studying um, your fields of study for so many years. I mean, you're the best people to tell us what you know like so many scientists have been doing and and we are perhaps the best people all to act on that information and to find the solutions that uh, will help us take us to the next chapter. And with that, I think um, one hour will never be enough to talk about this. Um, so it has been who knows? really great. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Salutera. Hope you feel better. And, Thank uh, you. Thanks, I do everybody. actually have a Thanks. cold Thanks. for everybody. <laughs> I really, really appreciate it. So thank you so, so, so very much, Iona, and the CMCC. Thank yes. you. Thank, thank you. you both. And really. read her book. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you to uh, the audience who was very active and uh, enjoyed uh, this Q&A session in a great way. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you for thank your availability. You.